Jenny Byrne, who is a consultant in Nottingham. And Jenny is going to speak to us about monitoring of chronic myeloid leukaemia and treatment aims. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Um, so as uh, Kate says, I'm going to be talking to you about how we monitor your response to treatment and what the aim, our, our aims are for your treatment. So as you've already heard, uh, the diagnosis of CML is usually made by someone looking down a microscope and seeing far too many of the white blood cells, particularly the granular sites, or also called neutrophils, uh, in the blood uh, film. Most patients, as you've heard, will go on to get a bone marrow test where we are establishing the diagnosis and checking what stage the uh, disease is in. As you've already heard, the vast majority of patients present in the chronic phase of the condition where most of the cells are these maturing granulocytes, but occasionally a small number of patients may present with more uh, primitive cells appearing in the blood and bone marrow, and those patients may be in the more accelerated or blast phase of the condition, which is more serious. As you've heard, we confirm the diagnosis by sending that bone marrow material to our cytogenetic labs where they isolate the chromosomes and look for the characteristic translocation between chromosomes 9 and 22 that uh, we've already heard about, the so-called Philadelphia chromosome. Our cytogeneticists are usually able to isolate the chromosomes for around 20 to 30 cells uh, from the bone marrow um, to look for this chromosome. And usually it's where in at diagnosis, 100% of the cells are involved. But this method is quite uh, labor intensive and takes a, a few days to get the result. So it's not an ideal test for monitoring how patients are doing. And furthermore, it involves a bone marrow each time, which is not that popular with the patients. However, as you've heard, we do understand now the molecular or genetic um, uh, result of this formation of the Philadelphia chromosome with the formation of the BCR Abel fusion gene. And we can utilize our knowledge of this to develop better tests for making the diagnosis and then monitoring patients. So one of the tests that can be used is uh, also actually looking at the chromosomes within the cells, but we can do this on blood rather than bone marrow. And this is where um, we can develop a probe, which is specifically designed to bind to either the BCR or the ABL uh, gene. So here we can see the ABL gene uh, probe binds and fluoresces red color, and the BCR, able, the BCR gene probe um, binds to BCR gene and uh, fluoresces in a green color. And in a normal healthy cell, obviously these two able genes should be on different chromosomes far apart and the two BCR genes should be on different chromosomes far apart. But as you can see here, when there's a BCR able fusion transcript, you get the green and the red binding together. And you can see this and uh, by the fluorescence, the, the dual fluorescence. And this FISH test, the fluorescence in situ hybridization test, can be used to monitor patients. Um, and we can do this on the blood. And we can look at about 100 cells, so quite a few more than we can with the uh, normal cytogenetic test. But it's still not really sensi sensitive enough to pick up low levels of uh, residual CML. So although it's useful, it's not the best test. Um, Again, by knowledge of the uh, BCR Abel fusion uh, gene, we can do something a little bit more clever at the DNA level, and this is called the PCR test. Um, and this will um, bind uh, to the, uh, the gene and allow us to tell for sure whether how many of these cells are still leukemic after a patient's been on treatment for uh, a, 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 a period of time. So in the PCR test, what we do is we make um, primers which are going to bind to the BCR gene and the ABL gene, and we add those primers to um, uh, uh, the sample of the patient's blood where the RNA has been extracted and um, re reverse transcribed into DNA. So in a, a, a normal cell, the um, PCR um, primers will bind to the uh, 
BCR and the ABLE genes, um, and then we get the, uh, uh, this is the, sorry, this is the wrong slide, I beg your pardon. Uh, it's gone in the wrong order somehow. Sorry, the, normally the uh, BCR and the ABLE genes uh, will bind far away from each other because they're not on the same um, uh, uh, fused together and we won't get a product. But when the BCR and ABLE genes are fused together, we get a product and then we have the uh, fluorescence probe that binds to the fusion gene um, and that emits uh, a fluorescent uh, signal and hence we're able to use that to measure the amount of fluorescence which is directly proportional to the amount of this uh, fusion gene that's, um, that, that's present in the sample. So we are able to use these primers and the fluorescent probe to actually quantify how much of the, um, the, the abnormal fusion gene is still present within the within the sample and whether a patient is responding or not. However, to do this um, uh, properly, we have to make sure that our sample is um, uh, a, an adequate sample and hasn't been degraded and we've managed to get the DNA out of the sample correctly. Um, and so we always have to use a fusion, uh, a control gene to actually make sure that the control gene is working. That's a gene that's present in everybody's cells so that we can uh, make sure that the control gene is working because if that's not working, we can't rely on the uh, patient's um, uh, so the result of the, on from the patient, because if, the, if the, there's zero DNA there, then we'll get a result of zero, but that doesn't mean to say the patient is responding correctly. Um, we have to make sure the control is working, and then we can believe the result we're getting from the uh, patient sample. So, uh, unfortunately, though, this can cause confusion because different laboratories use different machines to analyze the uh, samples and have different control genes. And so this uh, results in the same sample producing different results um, from different labs um, which can then cause confusion as to whether a patient is responding properly according to the goals of treatment that I'm coming on to. So we therefore have to make use of uh, quality control methods to make sure that all the laboratories are producing similar results. And this is done by um, a reference sample with a known number of uh, BCR-ABLE transcripts being sent out to all the different laboratories each laboratory runs its own test and produces a result using their own control samples um, and um, uh, send back their, their results back to the uh, uh, quality control uh, office, who then compare the results and uh, allocate each lab a correction factor or conversion factor by which they should multiply their result to get uh, all the results uh, produced being the same. So each laboratory is given a conversion factor and this is uh, used to make sure that all the results um, are the same. And the result of this is that if we uh, have results from different labs, as you can see, with all different levels, by multiplying uh, by the conversion factor, we can get all the results the same and then we can uh, be sure that all the patients are responding adequately. So this is the end result that we get from the laboratory. And as you can see here, we get a raw result um, of the uh, PCR uh, value. You can see the ABLE control gene has been used in this case. And we get a ratio of how much of the, trans trans, uh, the fusion transcript is compared to the ABLE ratio. And then below that, this is the uh, result to the international scale where the conversion factor has been uh, used to multiply this result to get the final result for the patient, which we can use to uh, decide whether they're responding adequately or not. So all patients need to have this uh, their disease monitored frequently, especially uh, at the beginning of their treatment. We can monitor their blood counts to make sure they're having a hematological response. There, we can do 
cytogenetic uh, test to monitor the cytogenetic response, but most uh, people mainly have their monitoring done by these uh, molecular uh, tests, the qPCR, and that should be done every three months in the first instance until until patients have achieved a good response, and that then at least every six months thereafter. However, unfortunately, not all of the patients in the UK or around the world are being managed by specialist CML doctors, and sometimes in smaller hospitals, the, the doctor looking after them is managing many patients with many different conditions, and we find um, several studies have shown that, unfortunately, monitoring isn't always done as frequently as it should be. Um, in a study uh, that was reported recently, only about 20% of patients actually had all the monitoring tests that they should have done. And that is the true in both uh, the United States and in Europe. So we do uh, like to tell our patients and advertise the fact that all of patients should be having the, these tests done and chasing up the results, making sure someone sees the results to make sure patients are having the, res the, re the response that is expected. Um, but uh, not all patients um, are unfortunately being monitored as adequately and it's your job as patients, if you're not getting these tests done, to be asking your consultant about what your results are. As you've already heard, we expect um, the results to reduce over time so that we expect patients to start with a high level um, of uh, DNA transcripts and then roughly a tenfold reduction at each um, three-month interval. Uh, so patients go down through a major cytogenetic response, through a cy complete cytogenetic response when the level of the transcripts is down below 1% and then down on into a major molecular emission and even lower. This is also shown here. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the, the ratio um, falls from 100% down to 10%, which is the target the, that we aim for at three months, down to 1% at six months, 0.1% at 12 months, and on down, down to these very low levels where it may be safe to stop the treatment in due course after a number of years. So, as I said, achieving early um, responses and achieving these uh, goals of treatment is very important for patients. As I've already pointed out, and just to be clear, we define an optimal response at each different time point, and we also uh, define where we think the treatment isn't working or is a failure. And these are slightly different. So an optimal responder at three months will have a PCR-able PCR uh, qPCR result less than 10% and or has achieved a partial cytogenetic response if a cytogenetic test is done, achieving less than 35% Philadelphia positive um, uh, cells by one of the cytogenetic uh, tests. If people haven't quite achieved this, we say that they're in the warning category, that they're not quite, their disease isn't going down quite as quickly as we'd like, but we don't say that the treatment has failed unless patients actually haven't achieved a haematological remission with a re uh, normalization of their blood counts, or if a cytogenetic test is done, still greater than 95% of cells are Philadelphia positive. These patients um, we're very worried about. Um, some in the warning category, we just want to make sure that they hit the targets at the next time point. Sometimes it, the response can be a bit slower. At six months, the optimal is a PCR less than 1% and a complete cytogenetic remission. Um, again, some people don't quite make this and they're in the warning category, but we do then say a, a treatment has failed for a patient, they should consider stop, uh, switching therapy if the BCR able is still above 10% at six months or if they haven't achieved a partial cytogenetic response. The goal at 12 months is a PCR less than 0.1%, also known as a major molecular emission. Again, we say that there, there is a failure of the treatment if the BCR able is greater than 1% at 12 months or if they haven't achieved a complete cytogenetic uh, response. At time points beyond 12 months, we hope that the uh, PCR will be stable or improving. 
and we say a patient's uh, treatment is failing if they've lost their response, um, which may be because they've developed mutations, as you heard. The reason these uh, milestones are important is that at every time point, we do know that patients who achieve the optimal level of response uh, do better than those that, that don't achieve. And this is shown most clearly in the three-month um, overall survival curve shown here, where those patients that have achieved uh, a PCR less than 10% in the yellow line are clearly having a better long-term survival than those that haven't. And this is true at the other time points as well. So if patients are not achieving the optimal goals of therapy, we've, as we've already said, this may be due to them unfortunately developing mutations that are blocking the treatment from working. And so a mutation screen should be requested to see if a mutation has developed. And this is useful to do this before we switch to a different treatment as if there is a mutation there, we do know which drugs are most likely to work in the presence of different mutations so we can make a more educated switch to a, a more appropriate therapy. We also um, would recommend that a mutation screen is done if the qPCR levels uh, start rising. And nowadays, we've got some special new methods of doing mutation screens using next generation sequencing, which allows us to pick up mutations at a lower frequency and just pick up very low levels of mutations, which may be stopping the treatment from working. By careful PCR monitoring, we can also um, decide which patients it would be safe to stop their treatment or reduce the dose. So we have um, several studies have been done, and you'll hear more about this later, which um, involve um, uh, stopping or reducing the dose of treatment for patients. And it seems to be pretty clear that patients with very low levels of PCR, less than 0.01, may be in a safe place for stopping their treatment. Picking up these very low levels of PCRs um, may, um, may be more difficult and different techniques can be used where the sample is partitioned and we get positive and negative uh, reactions uh, on the readout to pick up very, very low levels of residual uh, fusion transcripts. The important thing to note, too, if for patients who may be contemplating reduction of their dosage or discontinuation of treatment, is that and if that is happening, even more stringent and frequent monitoring should be done. And uh, this is taken from the uh, provisional uh, BSH recommendations that several of us have been working on where we're recommending that rather than three or six monthly monitoring, if a patient's are reducing the dose or uh, stopping treatment, the, the monitoring needs to be monthly for, for the first six months, then six weekly for the second six months, and then two monthly uh, for uh, another year or two. So our expectations for um, response to treatment has uh, increased over the years. Back in the 1970s or 80s, before we had effective treatments for CML, we were just aiming for patients to normalize their blood counts. When interferon came along in the 1990s, we were aiming to get cytogenetic responses. And then when imatinib came along, we were hoping that patients would achieve major molecular responses, as this seemed to be a safe place to stop them uh, advancing into the more advanced stages of the disease. However, Nowadays, the actual ultimate goal of treatment is for patients to achieve really low levels of uh, molecular response down here, uh, deep molecular response, allowing them to potentially stop treatment in the future. So just to conclude, PCR testing provides the most sensitive method to monitor CML. Most patients um, should be uh, making sure that they have samples at 3, 6, and 12 months because these predict the future outcome and may suggest that some patients uh, may need to switch their treatment or do a mutation screen if they're not achieving their satisfactory targets. Um, it is very important that we adhere to the monitoring guidelines and we need patients' uh, involvement to help make sure this happens. And we also uh, know that molecular monitoring may help us to identify patients who can consider stopping treatment, but then they will need increased frequency of monitoring. Thank you. I am just going to stop there and uh, 
we'll all have time for questions in, in a short while. Thank you. Uh, 